Welcome to Worship with St. Peter's United Church of Christ. My name is Lori Bevenauer, senior pastor with this congregation. And today I give thanks for all of you being with us, sharing in this experience and this experiment. And that's really what I think it is, an experiment in being the church and figuring out how to worship and how to connect with one another. Today, as you worship, try to connect with someone around you, even if you're the only person where you are. Maybe make a phone call or send an email or a postcard. Maybe just go outside and wave from a distance at someone who passes by. Make a connection. And then notice this world around you and all of its beauty. The song that I am about to invite you to sing claims the truth that we cannot own the sunlit sky. And that is reality. But we can take notice of one another, of creation, of the sacred. And that is what I hope you will do as you worship today. to reading the scripture, I just want to give you a little preview because we're making a big shift today. That shift is from the book of Genesis to the book of Exodus. And this is kind of weird, even for us. We've been reading from the book of Genesis for 10 weeks. I'm not sure there's ever been a time that we have stayed in a book of the Bible for that long. And today we shift to the book of Exodus. And we're going to stay here for about nine weeks. Now, I reserve the right to change course if we need to, because at St. Peter's, we try to keep things relevant. And it's possible that we'll just need to make a big old shift. And that's okay. But I also want to put out there that we want to try to stay in the book of Exodus. And the reason, well, there's a few reasons. One is that we don't often do that. We don't often stay. We jump around, we get what we need, we get a little New Testament here, Old Testament there, Greek scripture, Hebrew scripture, anything that sort of strikes us. And yes, we often stay in the lectionary. 
But to stay in the lectionary in just one book will offer us a different experience. And I believe that right now that will be helpful to us because we're living in a time when a lot of stuff is changing and some's not. But staying in the book of Exodus will help us to see what we miss when we only go a little bit into the stories. What I mean by that is this, the book of Exodus contains a lot of stories that I would call highlights or classics. They're the stories that show up in children's Bibles, the stories that show up in popular culture, the stories that are referenced in movies. Stories like manna falling from the sky, stories of Moses being rescued from the river, that's today's story by the way, stories of the Ten Commandments and the burning bush. They're highlight stories, but if we stay in the book of Exodus, we can also hear some of the stuff in between and go a little deeper into those stories. And that matters to me and to our congregation. And the reason is because at St. Peter's, we also believe in science. And science tells us that our brains can change and they change better and more if we change our patterns a little bit. If we change up what we do, our brains literally learn new things. And that seems like a really wise decision right now. We're already being forced to change up a lot of things like how we worship, where we eat, with whom we hang out, how we do school, the list is long. So why not change a little bit within that as well? So we're gonna stay in the book of Exodus, if at all possible. And we're going to journey with some pretty fascinating characters. Just a couple of more things before you hear today's scripture. Exodus, the word itself, is known as a word that describes a mass departure. It is often used to describe refugees leaving a particular place. And that's not all it means. Exodus. In Hebrew, the words itself, themselves in Hebrew mean, these are the names. That's what the book is called in Hebrew. These are the names. And it starts with a list of names that we are skipping over today. But that's why I wanted to jump in and say, we aren't entirely skipping over the names because that's how the book begins. And I don't know about you, but that's an important thing in our culture right now. You might have heard of the Say Their Names campaign. It's a campaign that encourages the use of names. The campaign tells us, say the names of those people who were killed because of police brutality. And don't just know them because of how they were killed. Know them because of their humanity because of what they brought to this world, not because of how they exited it. That's a pretty powerful, powerful connection to Exodus. These are the names. Today's story has the names of Shipra and Pua, the midwives, names I'm gonna guess you've never heard before, and names that I really hope you know by the end of this worship service. I'm not gonna give away the whole story, but please enjoy this beginning to our journey into Exodus, knowing that we want our brains to change. We want to continue to live out the mission of St. Peter's United Church of Christ, to be a welcoming community, to say their names, to share God's love with the world, to share the stories, and to find the spirit in life. To be surprised, not just by the hashtags or the headlines, but the depths to which these stories will take us. Listen, this is the beginning of our journey. A reading from the book of Exodus, chapter one, verse eight. A new Pharaoh, one who did not know Joseph came to power in Egypt. Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, Look at how powerful the Israelites have become. 
and how they outnumber us. We need to deal shrewdly with their increase, against a time of war when they might turn against us and join our enemy, and so escape out of the country. So they oppressed the Israelites with overseers who put them to forced labor, and with them they built the storage cities of Petum and Ramses. Yet the more the Israelites were oppressed, the more they multiplied and burst forth, until the Egyptians dreaded the Israelites. So they made the Israelites utterly subservient with hard labor, brick and mortar work, and every kind of field work. The Egyptians were merciless in subjugating them with crushing labor. Pharaoh spoke to the midwives of the Hebrews. One was Shifra, and the other one Pua, and said, When you assist the Hebrew women in childbirth, examine them on the birthing stool. If the baby is a boy, kill it. If it is a girl, let it live. But the midwives were God-fearing women, and they ignored the Pharaoh's instructions and let the male babies live. So Pharaoh summoned the midwives and asked them why they let the male babies live. The midwives responded, These Hebrew women are different from Egyptian women. They are more robust and deliver even before the midwife arrives. God rewarded the midwives, and the people increased in numbers and power. And since the midwives were God-fearing, God gave them families of their own. The Pharaoh then commanded all those in Egypt, Let every boy that is born to the Hebrews be thrown into the Nile, but let every girl live. Exodus chapter 2 There was a man from the house of Levi who had married a Levite woman, and she conceived and gave birth to a boy. And she saw that the baby was good, so she hid it for three months. When she could hide the baby no longer, she took a papyrus basket, daubed it with bitumen and pitch, and put the child in it and placed the basket among the reeds by the banks of the Nile. The baby's sister watched from a distance to learn what would happen. Pharaoh's daughter came down to the Nile to bathe while her attendants walked along the river bank. She noticed the baskets among the reeds and sent her attendant to fetch it. Opening it, she saw the baby and how it wept. She was moved to pity and said, This must be one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to the Pharaoh's daughter, Do you want me to go and find a nurse for you among the Hebrews to suckle the child for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the sister went off and brought the baby's own mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child with you and suckle it for me, and I myself will pay you. The woman took the child and nursed it. After the child was weaned, she brought it to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted it as her own. She called him Moses, he who pulls out. For she said, I pulled him out of the water. So here we are after the reading of a story in not the book of Genesis, everybody. We have moved from Genesis into Exodus. If you've been with us for a while, you will know that we've been hanging out in the book of Genesis for a lot of weeks. And now it's our turn to hang out in the book of Exodus for a lot of weeks. Um, Why? Because the stories matter and because these stories have so much to tell us and are actually more connected to our real life than one might think. which was exactly why I chose my conversation partner this week uh, to be Katie Lukes. Uh, She was surprised that I saw a connection between the story of Moses uh, and her work as missions team leader of St. Peter's. Um, And I found out through conversation that there was plenty more that we shared and that we found to be really fantastic about the scripture that you just heard. So Katie, go ahead and introduce yourself and, um, and we'll go from there. Yes. So I'm Katie Lukes. I am currently the missions team lead and uh, I've been at St. Peter's around four years Um, and I live in Westfield with my husband, uh, Matt Lawrence, and we have three kids. They are a sophomore at Purdue, um, sophomore at Westfield High School, and a seventh grader at Westfield Middle School. Um, And I I work in software um, and yeah, that's it. (laughs) <laughs> and that's all the things. That's all the things. Everything. There's so much more about you, Katie. Um, <laughs> but that's a great introduction. Uh, Katie and I, well, okay, we have a confession first. And it, it, it begins the first part of our conversation. So we have framed this conversation to be in three chapters. Uh, one is fear. Chapter two is choices. Chapter three is boundaries. 
Um, my greatest fear in virtual worship came true when Katie and I had a great experience of recording our entire conversation, and then it didn't record. So we are starting chapter one all over again a day later from a place of fear. And I just want to name that, Katie, because <laughs> how many of these conversations have I done? A lot. Um, all of them have recorded in the same way, same buttons. Man. You might have heard Katie's a software person, folks. It's not like she's a stranger to computers. Um, <laughs> and we tried. We tried resurrecting. We tried digging deep on the internet. It was gone. Yeah. It was gone. Yeah. So I say that because we are entering chapter one from a place of authenticity. Uh, the fear is real. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and you made the observation that that's how the story starts. So talk about the fear that you saw beyond the fear of the recording not working, which we have tested three times today, by the way. Yes. Um, yeah, so the the story, uh, as I started reading it, really that overwhelming um, emotion coming through, driving all the actions was yeah. fear. Um, when you think about um, Pharaoh and his place of power and, and being very concerned, you know, that this um, population of Israelites was growing more numerous and he tried something, you know, very reactionary <laughs> and violent um, and it didn't work. And so he was still scared and yeah. uh, and just tried to double down on that and, um, you know, be more violent, more reactionary. Um, and eventually we know that doesn't work either. Right. But it's such a I think natural response. I think both of us felt that way, that sometimes when we are fearful, um, we don't have the greatest response. And in fact, we, as you said, double down. And and Pharaoh did. He was really, really intimidated by um, a shift in his power. And he was fearful that the Israelites were going to take over. And um, so he found a way to stop that. And his suggestion was just kill all the male babies. You know, just get rid of them, which I guess is a solution, um, but only cast more fear into the community. And I just think that's really worth recognizing that when we are fearful and when we act in fear, it only adds more fear to the community. And that's really, really painful um, to me and I think to the people in the story. Um, so I also saw a link there for you as missions team leader, because we are in this season of pandemic. Um, St. Peter's has been known for a long time for its mission work and its its way of reaching out. Um, and one of the things we said early on at a ministry council meeting was we're kind of scared that we can't be the church that we've always been. Just talk about that a little bit, how that's been for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Reflecting on the missions work that St. Peter's has traditionally done, um, just looking through the list of things that the missions team does in terms of family promise um, and having families come into our church, feed them, play games with the kids, um, you know, be with them. Uh, East 10th Street dinners, um, the Washington UCC, the summer and Christmas work, uh, everything we do um, around Christmas, um, all of that, involves being hands-on and being with people. And um, I think that's something that traditionally our St. Peter's um, congregation has really enjoyed having that hands-on um, interpersonal relationship. And it really feels like you're doing the work if you are there with people. Um, and things are just different now. Um, so we obviously can't do that for health reasons, but beyond that, um, what the organizations say is most helpful to them a lot of times right now is money. Right, um, that's right. the way we can help them the most. And it is not a very satisfying way to do missions work, um, even though it is helpful and it does do the work. Um, it's also something that just feels like you're passing off a problem to someone else to solve. Um, and beyond that, it's also something that not everyone can do right now uh, where maybe they could give time uh, you know, in a in a previous time now, it's something where jobs are um, precarious. Uh, people are furloughed. People are losing jobs, and giving money is just not a, a way that's viable for people right now. Um, and it's tough. So, uh, 
thinking about how we move going forward, knowing that yeah. there's no date, there's no stop to this. Um, we really do have to think about in this time, what does it mean to do missions work at St. Peter's? Um, I don't have a nice clean answer to give today, but uh, but that is the conversation. You know, that's, that's what's um, in all of our minds as we think about what it means to show God's love in the world um, the way we would like to. Oh my gosh. You even get bonus points, Katie. You totally just quoted our St. Peter's mission statement (laughs) to be a welcoming community, to share God's love with the world and to find the spirit in life. And um, that's what we're trying to do, even amid this time that is so, so different. Um, One of the things that I had mentioned to you in writing and, and in talking is I just keep hearing my high school English teacher um, who who said and who made sure we had correct in our papers um, that surfaces are hard and situations are difficult. And oftentimes we say it's hard, right? But this is not a surface. This is a situation. So tables are hard. Walls are hard. Um, but situations are difficult. And the difference in those words is something that's hard is just tough. It's it's concrete. It's impenetrable. Something that's difficult is complex. It requires deeper thinking. It requires a different approach. And that's what I hear in how you're responding during the pandemic um, with the missions team is to say, this isn't just hard. It's not like we're going to like break through this wall. Mm-hmm. It's that we have to figure out how to do missions differently. Um, for those who receive the help and also for those who give it, because we aren't all able to give in the same way. Um, And all of that grows out of this context of fear. The beautiful thing about today's story, and I think about the way that our congregation is responding, is that um, it doesn't end in a place of fear. And in fact, fear moves us right into chapter two, um, which our choices. And what we find in the story is that there are people who are fearful. So um, the mother of Moses, in fact, is fearful that her child will be killed. And her solution is to make the choice to send her child down a river in a basket. It's a little intense, right? Like that's a big choice to make. Um, And it's made out of fear, but also out of hope that there could be a better life for her child. Um, And so that's what she does. Um, And the midwives on the other end of the river discover the child. And they become the main characters of this story, along with Pharaoh's daughter. So um, when you started thinking about those choices, and as you think about the choices that we're making as a congregation, where does that leave you? Yeah, uh, so right now, it feels like Everything is difficult choice. Um, so I yes. dropped my son off at Purdue today, um, oh. and man, <laughs> yeah. oh. that was a choice uh, to send him back. You know, we they offered uh, virtual options, just like all of our, you know, our high schools and middle schools, and um, you know, that's a choice about whether um, what we feel comfortable with and what we don't. Um, and, and those are choices that are happening all over the place. Um, people who have much harder choices than I do. Um, and, uh, I think the question that always comes to me when I'm thinking through these and, uh, you know, when our leaders are making choices, um, and we as a church are making choices is what's the motivation behind, you know, the, um, the decision we make. Is it, um, something that we're doing out of, fear if we think about you know fearless choices you know are obviously fear driven um yeah. or are we doing them out of concern um out of um uh, someone else's welfare if we're yeah. thinking about things that are the best for the other people um the motivation behind the decision uh that's sort of what i get out of this story is that it, it um matters you know the consequences totally. and how Uh, the nature of your choice, um, the motivation behind it matters. I think that's so huge. And we can get, we can cruise by that so quickly. We can all make different choices and, and people making very different choices can be making the right choices for themselves. It's the motivation behind those choices, the why, which really, really matters. And That gets illuminated in this story in a pretty cool way. Um, We mentioned the midwives. Um, If you knew, 
this is how I like to say it. If you know three names in the Bible, if you know Jesus, Shipra, and Pua, I'm happy. I don't, you can forget all the rest. Shipra and Pua, whom I'm guessing you've never heard of until today, are fantastic. They are amazing, amazing characters, individuals, historical figures. I'm not sure, but remember their names. And here's why. Um, Shipra and Pua are Semitic names. Um, it is likely that they were not Semitic, that they were Egyptian. And the reason we believe that is because it's not likely that a Hebrew woman um, would actually be able to kill Hebrew babies. That, that's just not likely. They probably could not obey Pharaoh's orders. So we believe, scholars believe, theologians believe that they, they were actually probably Egyptian. If that's the case, it's even more amazing what their choice is, right? So they start in this place of fear, like, are we going to obey what Pharaoh says? Are we going to do these things? What are we going to carry out? And then they make the choice to disobey him and to save this baby. And that's huge. And when we find out that they do that and they probably were Egyptian, that's an even bigger deal. And so... It does push back to that question of why would they do it? For me, I think they saw the humanity. They felt that connection to another human being in a way that they just couldn't ignore. And they were willing to take the risk. That seems super important to me. And really, I mean, super inspiring as well. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So what resonates for you with Shipra and Pua? Yeah, uh, again, that uh, thought of why are you making the choice? So I'm, I'm sure they were plenty scared of Pharaoh. Um, and you can imagine a choice that they would make out of that fear um, to obey and, and do what they were told. Um, but the scripture says they feared God. That's the fear that is actually mentioned. Um, and so what they were really motivated by was that, you know, concern for humanity. And that was what... Uh, ultimately drove their decision. Uh, so yeah, that motivation is what just jumps out at me with them. Well, and it's amazing when you think that they feared God and not in a God's going to hurt me, but God knows me, right? Like God knows me and we want to be in connection with God. Um, and I wonder if that can be a motivation for us as well. Like it's not lost on me that we are living in a season that can cause so much fear, right? There's there's fear surrounding a pandemic. There is fear surrounding civil unrest. Um, there's fear, I'm going to name it, around this election cycle. We're something like 70 days away. Um, and, and most of us are like, oh my gosh, how are we going to endure this for another 70 days, right? Um, and so we're already living in this culture of fear, which means that there are choices ahead of us. Like we have the choice to vote for a particular person or not. We have the choice to be a part of conversations surrounding Black Lives Matter, surrounding the history of our communities, surrounding how we interact with local police. We have a choice, right? And we have a choice in this pandemic, which you alluded to in, in taking your son back to school, right? Like some of the choices are really at home and some of them are um, a lot bigger in the world. And I don't know about you, but for me, I if I stay in that place of fear, I start to spiral. If I start to look at all the choices, I'm totally wrecked, <laughs> right? But if I check in with myself and go, where's my connection to God? I, I can sort of stop the spiraling and refocus and know how I need to respond, which might be different from you. Does that ever happen for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um... My fear response is typically more, um, it depends, but uh, maybe like freezing, you know, and I'll just yeah. stand very still, <laughs> wait till this passes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's another form of reaction. It's, it's yeah. not a terribly healthy one. But when I uh, do sort of have that motivation to push through um, and, you know, there's no way through but through, uh, then... <laughs> And I can typically get over it. 
Yeah, totally. And you, um, you were the one who gave me language for chapter three, and I think this points to it. Um, so this is chapter three, boundaries. Um, we talked about how the midwives, Shipra and Pua, uh, pushed the boundaries, right? To be fair, Pharaoh pushed the boundaries as well, but not in a way that I would, you know, support. <laughs> um, but Shipra and Pua were aware of boundaries that needed to be broken, and they did that. But you had insights about boundaries that were were almost the opposite. Tell me, tell me how you got to the boundary conversation. Yeah, so interesting. So uh, I think when we had first talked about boundaries, um, we were talking about them as healthy things. Uh, you know, yeah. Grandpa has set a very healthy boundary, um, you know, morally for themselves. Um, but typically, when I think about boundaries for myself or ones that I personally set, um, I see the flip side of it. You know, I see the yep. uh, negative side. I think of it as being closed off. Um, yeah. And uh, when I do that, I know those things are typically fear-driven boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. We we talk about setting boundaries for kids or setting boundaries for people who have misbehaved, that's a big deal, whether it's an adult or a child. Um, boundaries do get cast in a negative light a fair bit. And so I appreciated when you said that because I didn't realize how much connotation even the word boundary has. Um, and, but you and I also had an interesting discovery about a boundary that we share that we didn't know we shared, uh, but it kind of opened some stuff up for us, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I have a, a sort of a, a mental mental boundary um, where I have a very deep fear of entertaining hosting. I, it's dumb and I, I fully acknowledge that. But it, it is something that's like head trash, something that I uh, struggle with because uh, when I think about having people over, it, it scares me to death. I, I don't know why. There's something about like my house is too messy or my dogs will misbehave or the food is terrible. Like I, or, um, I don't know. I don't know what it's it is. It's all the things. Katie and I share this. And so when she wrote this to me in email, I was like, wait, I'm not the only one who hates this. <laughs> like I can work myself up for weeks. And sometimes I can just say, I'm just not doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. I just, I just can't do it. And, and it's not that I haven't had good experiences or that I'm not reasonably competent at such things. I just, it does not feed my soul. Like I want it to. And yet we have both found that it's a boundary we need to push. So um, tell me what that or, you know, talk about what that feels like when that, when that boundary of yeah. I'm not hosting, <laughs> when that's pushed, right. what happens? Right. Yeah. Um, it is typically so my husband, Matt, if um, you know, any of you know him, is a, a very social person, loves having people over. He's, yep. he's wonderful. Um, and so uh, sometimes for him, we will have people over um, and <laughs> fine. it's always fine. Um, and it's something that I do have to know that like, okay, for him, for my kids, for whomever, you know, this is something that we're all going to do together and it's going to be great. And it yeah. always is. It is, it is, but we need that pushing, right? And we need to, yeah. that sort of mental shift of this isn't going to be horrible. Um, and I think that's an important part of this story as well, that the boundaries are pushed for all the right reasons. And again, we're back to the why. Well, why did they push the boundary? Because they wanted to save a life, right? Um, and that that's a really, um, it's a really fascinating twist, um, but also a really hopeful one. And so I, that's one of the things I hope that we can get out of this particular story is that the boundaries do need to be pushed in really in ways that are uncomfortable for us, right? It's still not comfortable for me to host people in our home. I still get all worked up. I still convince myself it's a bad idea. And even after the fact, I'm like, it was horrible. Um, and, it, and it wasn't, right? But if I can get that worked up about hosting someone in my home, uh, imagine how worked up I can get about things like racial injustice or homelessness or um, a pandemic that is hurting people unnecessarily. Like, that's big. Um, and so I, I think there's reason to rest in this idea that yes, fear exists. There are always choices. The story calls us to push some boundaries. And, and the last thing that I want to throw in there is something that you actually started with, because mm -hmm. I asked you to. <laughs> um, I asked you to name your husband, because Katie and Matthew do not share the same last name. And um, names matter. 
right? Names matter. And I know it took me a little bit to figure out who was who and, and how everybody went together, which it should not be that complicated, but somehow it is. I'm sure you go through this more than once. Um, and Shipra and Pua, of course, names matter. The book of Exodus, as I mentioned earlier, its name matters. And Moses, you know, one of the main characters of the story, who's just a baby here, his name matters. So Moses, um, when Pharaoh's daughter takes him, she names him. The name that he is given literally means my son or son of Ramses. Okay. Well, that's great. But um, it also means in Hebrew, Moshe, uh, it means pull out. Now, it's ironic because most people think that's because he was pulled out of the water. And in one way, that's true. But the scholars who have researched this have figured out that the verb, it's, the, the word itself is a verb. And it's an active verb, not a passive one. So it's actually not that he was pulled out of the water, but that he will pull out. And what he will pull out as the Israelite people. He's going to save the people. Like... The important part about Moses is not what he has done or how he started as one who was pulled out of the water, but what he will do and how he will change the world ahead of him. And that, to me, is everything we need to know, right? The important thing is how we are going to act, not what we've done before. That seems like a good thing to learn for a missions team leader in the middle of a pandemic, right? <laughs> um, or a really good thing for a parent to think about after dropping their kid off at college, or a really good thing for a congregation to think about. It's not who we've been, but what we are becoming. And it's often unrecognizable to us in the moment. What have we missed that we totally wanted to tell people, Katie? Um, I think we got it all. Do we um, wanna talk about uh, event coming oh, up on the 29th we totally do yeah see i knew we forgot something <laughs> yeah what we were going to say is um yeah we haven't done this before because we've sort of kept these conversations to be um timeless but this one is not going to be timeless because one of the ways that we are changing is by doing ministry different and katie sits on ministry council and they had a brainstorm of how to be the church in a pandemic um in this really weird season so Light the Night is coming up on August 29th from 7 to 8 p.m. And Katie, what can people expect? It's going to be great. So <laughs> uh, it will um, be an evening of um, uh, a time where we can all come together, even for a short time. Um, and those who are comfortable talking and socializing at a safe distance will be able to do so. If you're not comfortable with that, there's still things to do. Um, and so... Uh, the Ministry Council has been very thoughtful and um, creative in thinking about ways to at least do something that, um, again, exactly like you were saying, Lori, uh, helps us come together, but in a new way, in a way that, you know, maybe we wouldn't have done in the past. So um, this will be on the 29th, like you said, and there will be um, stations set up around the sort of the St. Peter's campus on the outside. Uh, there will be uh, an area in the habitat with canvases um, where people will be able to write, get glow sticks. Um, That's the light up part. Glow sticks are part. coming, friends. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there will be a walk uh, with prayer stations around the habitat and then also a place for making a little bit of music. Yep. And um, from a missions point of view, there will be a place also where you will probably want to stop first, actually. Um, so <laughs> right now, uh, something that I was not aware of until Liz Chandler brought it to my attention uh, is that there's a coin shortage uh, with the pandemic. Um, yep. And so our families uh, who are with Family Promise don't have a good way to get coin-operated laundry going. They any other coin-operated you know services that they need, they don't have um, access to quarters. So uh, what we'd love to do as a St. Peter's congregation is collect all our extra quarters. I know we've got some laying around, um, yep. and so we'll 
collect those on the 29th at a, a spot. Uh, Liz Jenley will be there doing the collection and yep. I will be able to give those to Family Promise uh, for those that need it's them. It's going to be super fun. And we were aware that there are um, there's some fear in getting together. There are choices that people have to make and there are boundaries that some are willing to cross and others are not. So we're asking that people come masked. We're asking that social distance be maintained. And we know that that's not enough for everybody. And so if that's too much of a boundary to cross for you, um, we also are going to have sidewalk chalk that you can decorate a parking spot and stay in. And if you want to stay in your car, you can just park your car and we'll wave. It's all good. Um, we're just trying to find ways for people to be connected. And if even being out is too much, and we understand if it is, um, I'm going to do a walkthrough with a video that we can send then and and share some of the prayers and the experience with others. So we're really trying to figure out how to be church and how to do togetherness, recognizing that there are different risks for different individuals and different groups of people, um, and honoring that we're still trying to carry out our mission, to be welcoming, to share love, and to find spirit. So um, that's our goal. We're taking a little bit of inspiration from Shipra and Pua and of course the journey of Moses um, that like I said is starting this week and will be with us for a number of weeks. So think about the fear that you carry, the choices that are ahead of you, and the boundaries that need a little bit of pushing. And then know that there are many of us on that journey with you. Katie, it's been delightful to talk with you. We're both crossing our fingers right now that this second recording really worked. Um, so thank you, friends, for being with us, for sharing the story, and for delving into um, the beginning of the next chapter. We'll see you soon.
Someone is calling your name. It's the sacred, our God, everlasting love. Whatever name you choose for yourself or for that which you consider sacred, draw it to your mind now. Collect up all those names of people for whom you'd love to pray. Hold them in your heart. Draw them to mind. And know that as we enter this prayer, none of us is alone. Allow yourself to get lost in these running waters. Imagine that you were like Moses' mother, right at the edge of the water, ready to make a big choice to take a big risk. That's what prayer is. A choice and a risk to be vulnerable, to welcome the unknown, to be connected to the holy. Let us pray together. Great flow of justice, even larger than great waters, dividing and reuniting. Place us in that gymnastic zone, the judgment-free place, where our fat and our flaws matter less than our faith. Our lollygagging and loneliness matter less than our love. And our own judgments and jealousies matter less than your justice. Let this virus be the catalyst for real change in ourselves, each other, and our beloved country. Let it teach us how one life flows into another always and regularly. Indeed, our lives do flow into one another. As we rest our eyes upon this flame and these words of hope-filled justice, may our prayers simmer to our lips and through our hearts to the very core of our being. We pray for those who hurt, the ones who mourn, those who are trying to find their value. We pray for the ones who are out of work, those who are searching, and we pray for the ones who have too much, who are struggling to know what to do and how to give and in what way generosity speaks to them. We draw to mind the names of those who celebrate, the ones who rest in joy, those who are smiling from ear to ear for whatever reason. God, we give thanks for new beginnings, even the false starts, even the moments when we wish it hadn't gone the way it had. For the many who have started or will start school, for those who carry new burdens of leadership and authority. For the ones who continue to slog away on the front lines. And for those who feel as if everything 
should be back to normal. Whatever that means, we pray. God, help us to see our choices, to honor our fears, to begin to push a few boundaries. Teach us how to say their names, how to stand up for justice, how to learn where we've been misguided. And through all of it, God, offer us comfort but not too much. Offer us challenge, but not too much. Offer us vision. Way too much vision. So that we might dream with you. And start to transform this world with you. And begin to see the beauty in our own spirits in our own bodies, in our own reflections, with you. God, we honor the journey that we have begun. We recognize who, those who have come before us. We dream of the ones who will traverse this world after us. And gathering up all those spirits, those names, those realities. We pray together. Our Creator God, holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Consider this a postscript to prayer. I have one of these daily calendars sitting on my desk. It happens to be of African wisdom. And I noticed the other day when I flipped the page that it read this. For the sake of peace, hard decisions must be made. <laughs> you know now how much that irritates me. I really do believe it should read, difficult decisions must be made. But here's the thing. It annoys me just enough that I leave it as it is. I could have gotten a Sharpie out and changed it, but I didn't. I just left it reading about the hard decisions because honestly, it annoys me just enough that I actually do it. I take a moment and I choose to make the difficult decisions, not for just any reason, but for the pursuit of peace. I'm pretty sure that's what matters, that we make the difficult decisions in an effort to bring peace to the world. If we can do that, if we're willing to make difficult decisions, then that's the way our prayers continue. I hope that you find something this week that irritates you just enough that it causes you to do something differently in your life. Make the change and definitely pursue peace. In your many names, God, may it be so.
somebody's calling your name. And I hope that you respond like the midwives, Shipra and Pua. I hope that you respond like they did. Honor your fears. Recognize that you have choices. And then push some boundaries, preferably in the direction of widening the welcome, pursuing justice, and bringing peace to this world. God, God who loves each of us, in your many names, we pray that change and joy and love will come. Amen.